Okay, we are live now. Hi, excellent. And how was the game for France? Well, it's 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 pretty difficult. We have probably the best attackers in in the world, and uh, it's very difficult to score. So, not not very happy with this game. Yeah, I, I was in a. Um... Uh, athletics event with my athletes. I have mm -hmm. a few young athletes, and I had, I had to come a little bit early to do this, uh, but it's going well for us. So good. And if you if you educate them correctly, they can they can handle competitions uh, without the coach. So yeah, you will you will be happy. Yeah. That's what I try to do with them, to give them the tools to do everything by, by themselves. Because now I have a lot of uh, young athletes, so I, I need to be flexible and mm -hmm. be with, with each athlete doing uh, different things because I have some, uh, some that are really good uh, with throwing, but others that are better jumping, sprinting. Mm -hmm. So I do different things. They all do the same things, but some I know now that they can do more jumps or sprinting. It's cool. Excellent. Yeah. So I think we can start now. Yeah, sure. So uh, welcome to all uh, who are watching us right now. Uh, today, today, I have the pleasure to be talking with uh, uh, J.B. Mohan, a sports science professor and researcher uh, with a PhD in, in human motor function. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the force velocity relationship. But first, uh, I would like uh, to ask you, uh, what led you to study sports science? Well, thank you for inviting me first. I'm uh, very happy to, to discuss and, and contribute. Um, I guess, I, guess I, was, I was very, very fascinated with science at the beginning. And I was uh, doing a lot of sports. So in, in my high school years, I was a football player, a pretty good level, and then an athlete. And so when I, when I had to make a choice for the faculty, I decided to mix both. I decided to, to go to the, to the science in the field of sport. And so I started that. And in France, uh, sports science and physical education studies are the same. They are mixed. But after, uh, for, the, um, for the bachelor, but in the master's, you can choose physical education or sports science. So I decided to, choo to choose uh, sports science. And then I went on to the PhD. But... I guess my main uh, motivation was better understand my own practice and, uh, and better understand the training uh, if, because I was a coach at some point. So that's the idea, but better understand what I was doing and, and, and the performance. Yeah. Here in Portugal, it's almost the same. Uh, we have uh, physical ed education mixed with uh, sports science but we can choose uh, in the bachelor between uh, sports training or as exercise and health. And a few choose uh, physical education in the masters and others go to uh, exercise and health or uh, sports training, or in my case, uh, high performance training. Yeah. yeah, it's about the same, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I wanna ask you another personal question if I, I can. Yeah. Uh, what led you to choose a, a career in as a professor and as a researcher? Well, that, that's a good question. Um, my initial my initial dream was to be a high performance uh, coach, uh, staff, so a physical prep or something. But um, I would say that I I love teaching. I really love uh, you know uh, teaching things to people. And when I was very young, I, I paid my studies by being a, a tutor, a, a teacher for young people at school, teaching mathematics, physics, English. And uh, so I never had the opportunity to be on a professional staff. 
but I, I, I make money for teaching. So I went to this, to this path. And in France, if you want to teach at the faculty and become a professor, you need to have a PhD. So yeah, that, that's basically, um, I had more opportunities in teaching than, than in professional staff. And I think I prefer teaching. Uh, now with the, with the experience, I feel like uh, professional staff people have a really stressful and, uh, and, and, and uncertain uh, work. Yeah. Uh, very passion, uh, fascinating work with high-level people, but um, uh, it's maybe more stable in academia, I, I would say. Yeah. And um, I think it's fair to say that the, your main area of uh, research is related with sprint performance and uh, the force velocity relationship, right? Um, and I want to ask what made you choose uh, this subject in particular? So it, it, <clears throat> it's interesting because um, my, my master's degree topic uh, was about sprinting, uh, the determinants of performance in sprinting. And, but I also work in many, many different locomotion studies, uh, running, walking, and so on. But yes, in, indeed, the last 10 years have been um, a lot of sprinting and, and jumping. Uh, I think that what, what made me focus on that was the fact that we we could generate some methods and we could generate some, some concepts that um, made us study this a little bit deeper. And this, this was, uh, on, honestly, I think we have published many pilot studies. So it means studies that are studying something for the very first time. Yeah. And this is, this is the most exciting part of my job is to, okay, we have a, no, a new idea, we are going to test that and we are going to see what happens. And, uh, it happened a lot in sprinting. So maybe that, that was the most, um, the big driver, uh, innovation. I see, I see. So going to the main subject of today, I want to start by asking you, uh, why should we measure uh, the force velocity profile? Okay, so that, that's a very general question and, and, and it's the first one to ask. So basically when you, when you want to assess performance, um, if, you do a, if you do a sprint test or if you do a jump test, you will only assess one part of the capability of the athletes, their performance at the test. But it will not give you a good information. It will only give you their performance at the test. You cannot uh, extrapolate that to their muscle capabilities because to know their muscle capabilities, you need to test them in a very um, a broad way. Uh, uh, context. For example, if you test me on a 30 meter sprint, you cannot tell the, the force output or you cannot tell the, my, my, my capabilities because if you test me on a 10 meter instead, or if you test me on a 100 meter instead, you will have different information. So the force velocity profile is, is a way to get a very, very large amount of information, not about performance, but about the capabilities of people, which is a bit different. Uh, what is your force output uh, against a high load, against a low load? It's exactly the same for jump eight. If you just test me on a squat jump, you will know my squat jump eight, but it will absolutely not tell you my force output, my power, and so on. So I think we pretty clearly demonstrated that two athletes with the same performance at a test can have very different force, velocity, capabilities. I always take the example of physiology because it's very fun because it is clear in physiology, but it is not clear in biomechanics. Take two people, they have the same, two, uh, the same mile time, the same 150 meter time. Do you say that they have the same VO2 max? Never, you would never say that. Do you say that they have the same lactate at the end of the race? Never. You will never say that. So it's exactly the same for biomechanics. So if you do a test of a performance, you will have a low level of information. So it's better to measure the force and the velocity output and to have the, the big spectrum, the big picture. And with that, the coach can know if uh, one athlete needs to train more in the velocity or in the, the force part of this practice, right? Yes. Yeah, so that's the, I would say that's the, 
it's the final part of the of the of the chain of thinking one part before is that when you do the profile first you know exactly what the athletes are made of you know their exact characteristic then yes if you want to address some specific points you can use that information but that will be a, a, a last step to me there is four steps you assess performance you calculate or you interpret force and velocity output. So you have the individual profile. You interpret what they need. And then you can orient the training. That, that, that's to me, to me, that's the best way to go. And if you take one step before the other, or if you speculate about one step without measuring it, you, you might do some mistakes. Yeah, I see. So it's fair to to say if we use um, a force velocity, if we measure the force velocity profile, we should also use a velocity based training approach. Yes, yes, it it is it is the best way to then uh, regulate and set the training because the, the the force velocity profile tells you what is your force capability at every given velocity. Of, of the possible spectrum. So then if you want to stimulate some specific parts, you will go there uh, using what we could call velocity-based training, which means you will regulate the load as a function of the movement velocity you target. So I'm going to give you a very good example. If you want to improve someone at a very high velocity, then you will make sure that the training content is at very high velocity. If you want to be specific, in my opinion, the first approach is to be specific. It, it, it will make more sense to work at high speed if you want to improve high speed than to work at high loads. You see what I mean? It's, it's yeah. first, first things first, you know? So that's, that's the way it is. And yes, at some point you will have to know what's happening and you will have to measure velocity for that. I see. And, um... Now about how can we uh, measure the force velocity profile? Can you tell us about like uh, some field uh, devices we can use right now to do that? Yes, so the, the thing that's interesting is that the, the reference method is a force plate and, and a video system that is in a laboratory. So yeah. if you want to know my jumping or my sprinting profile, you can do that very, very accurately. But the problem is that many people don't have access to that. So we have developed some uh, computations uh, uh, methods to uh, measure the force outputs and the velocity with only displacement and time information. So in jumping, all you need is the jump weight with different loads. And in sprinting, all you need is the sprint times. And so, uh, there has been some, some uh, iPhone and iPad apps developed, my jump and my sprint, where you can film the movement and get what we call the input information. So what's very interesting in the methods we have developed is that the input information is pretty cheap and pretty easy to get. Yeah. And then there are some computations. So of course, if you have the choice, use the reference methods but if you don't have the choice, and if you do it correctly, you can have very good information. Yeah, I see. And uh, I want to talk about the, a little bit about fatigue, uh, fatigue right now because it's the area I'm trying to research right now in my, for mm -hmm. my thesis. And I uh, want to know what you know about uh, the, the effects uh, the fatigue can have on the force velocity profile. Or I can say it in another way, like, uh, can we use um, the force velocity profile as a tool to assess the recovery of the athlete? Yes, so that's very interesting because uh, here we are going to separate uh, jumping and sprinting. In jumping, we, we, made some, we, we have some studies on, on repeated sprints or on, on football games where we observe the change in the profile after repeated sprints or during a football game. And we have also done a studies over a season because a season is a kind of chronic fatigue, okay? So yes, the profile changes, 
and it changes in a different way depending on the individuals. So this is very important because very soon we will do some research on what we call the not the force velocity profile, but the force velocity endurance profile. And this is to me uh, fascinating. And these are some studies that are directed by Pierre Samosino, my, my colleague and friend, because if you and I have the same force velocity profile in jumping when we are fresh, very likely we will have different changes in our force velocity profile when we are fatigued. And this is crazy because it changes the entire story. So there has been already one or two studies by a French guy named Jean Rivière. And uh, it shows that uh, people have different force velocity endurance profiles. Uh, and, and so it's not going to be a two point discussion. It's going to be a three point discussion because obviously in many sports, uh, team sports, uh, volleyball, basketball, and so on, uh, endurance is a very important thing. And I would say, for example, let's say, I don't have a very good power output and I don't have a very good force velocity profile in, in jumping, but I have a very good endurance capability. Maybe this is important information if I am a, a team sport player. You see what I mean? So yeah. we're, we are going to have this three dimension approach now, not only uh, two, di two dimensions. Really cool. And, and now I, I, I want to ask you something that I, I think I don't, understand still what we can uh, do with uh, both uh, horizontal and vertical components of the force velocity profile. And um, this is because uh, we can say like in a, a hundred meters a sprint uh, is closely related with the technical capability uh, to generate uh, a lot of horizontal force. Um, and therefore uh, taking this into account why should the coach uh, choose to evaluate uh, both uh, the horizontal and vertical component mm -hmm. um, if his main concern is sprint performance? So that, that's a very good information, uh, a very good question because yes, um, over the last 10 years, I have changed my mind on that. Mm -hmm. and, and I will explain you my, my thought process and you will understand the, 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 my answer. At the very beginning, I was thinking, for, because first, I, I need to start with that. In trained people, the two profiles are not very well correlated. Yeah. So this is, this is the first point. It means if you, have, if you have low level people, some kids, some, you know, yes, if you have power in jumping, you will have power in sprinting and that's, you know. But when the level increases, uh, our studies show that the correlation decreases. Mm -hmm. So it means you have to be specific. And at the beginning, because of that information, I told, well, if you're interested in sprinting, uh, forget jumping uh, assessment because you don't need that. But then I changed my mind because we know that um, the jump profile gives you an idea of the non-specific force capability. For example, what we call F0 in the, in the vertical profile is equivalent yes. to the 1RM. Mm -hmm. And so if you have that information, you know the absolute maximum force capability of the athlete. And if you think about sprinting, this is very important because sprinting is generating force in the horizontal direction to accelerate and then generating force uh, mostly oriented vertically when you are at top speed. So if you have someone that is not very good at accelerating and you know that this person has a good maximum force output on the vertical axis, you know that the problem is what we could call the transfer. The problem is that it's a big force machine, but when it comes to pushing horizontally, it's not good. And then you know that you need to work on technical uh, propulsion capability. But if this person is, let's say, not good in the horizontal direction, and this person is not good at all in the vertical direction, you know that, let's say, the motor is not good. So you can have some gym work to improve force capability and an additional sprint work. So I would say that the, the, if, you, if you work with people sprinting, football, basketball, rugby, sprinters, whatever, the vertical information is good because it will tell you their 
um, absolute capability of force in the legs, you know? And I think this is a good information because if you don't have that information, you will not exactly know what is missing in the sprint puzzle. That, that, is, that is why I changed my mind. And today, even if both profiles are not connected, I will tend to measure both to have this maximum force information. I see. Makes a lot of sense. And um, I, I, one day I saw one video of you talking about uh, the, the relationship between uh, force velocity profile and hamstrings injuries. And uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit uh, about it. Yes, so um, we have to start the story by saying that the hamstrings are very important muscles for acceleration. You, um, there is a link between your hamstring force and activation capability and your acceleration performance. So they contribute to that, step number one. Step number two, and this has been, this has been shown in, in very recent studies doing very cool uh, modeling and so on. So this is pretty clear, okay? The hip extensors. Yeah. The step number two is that we discovered that after hamstring injury treatment, so some football players, they get a hamstring injury, they go to the rehab, they come back to play. And when we test them at that point, we observe that they have a very low, much lower, force capability during acceleration. So we say, that's interesting because um, compared to themselves before the injury or compared to their teammates that are control group, they have a lower force output in sprinting. So this is very interesting because it is not a single, it is not a manual force test of the hamstring. It is not isokinetic testing or whatever. It is sprinting. When you have a hamstring issue, we observe almost always that the force output in sprinting is lower. So this is connecting to the first point. If they contribute and they have a problem, your force output is lower. So the step number three is the step that we, that we are about to publish. So this is a breaking news here, but the paper is in revision. The step number three is to say, well, can we anticipate, is there a prospective link between a low maximum force output in sprinting and a risk of injury. Why do we think that? Because we think that if you have a low force output in sprinting, it is maybe because your hamstrings don't contribute a lot. And so it's maybe because they are weak in the specific task of sprinting. You see what I mean? So we have monitored uh, many, many football and, and rugby players. And uh, I think something like, almost 200 of them. And we saw that the, the force output in sprinting was lower in the test before some hamstring injuries occurred. So be very careful, not in the beginning of the season, but when you repeat the testing during the season, like every two months, you have a good information as to the risk of injury. So of course, it is not a red light and if, you're, if your maximum force is low in sprinting, you will have an injury. It's not the way it works. But statistically, people who get injured had a lower F0 than the people who did not. And this is the link uh, with injury. So, of course, it's, it's going to be one piece of the puzzle, but it's a, it's a significant piece. I see. Really good. And thank you to give these breaking news. <laughs> yeah, but it's fun because uh, we have presented that and it's online on my YouTube channel in a Congress of the IOC uh, mm. four years ago. And it was only wow. preliminary data, but if you want to be powerful statistically with injuries, you need to collect a lot of injuries and a lot of data. So it took us many, many years uh, to, to follow some groups during the season. As you know, because of the COVID, we had to stop some of the studies and all that stuff. But uh, yes, today the, 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 the statistics are uh, powerful enough to conclude. Yeah, I see. Uh, uh, another thing that I'm trying to uh, assess right now with my, my thesis is related uh, also with the post-activation potentiation uh, effects uh, on the, um, the force velocity uh, profile. Um, and um, 
because uh, here in Portugal, I don't know about France, but here in Portugal, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, coaches that use uh, post uh, potentiation activa um, post activation potentiation protocols, and uh, I'm trying to see if we can uh, see some uh, changes in the the profile of the athlete doing this uh, protocol. Um, mm -hmm. You, do you know uh, any, any studies uh, about that? Uh, some things that you can could. No, I, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of a specific study, uh, but I'm aware of studies using. Well, you know, PAP is a lot discussed about. Uh, um, should we call that really PAP, or is it just uh, an improved way to warm up? But that's another discussion. Yeah. But let's call that PAP, so everybody understands. The fact that you improve your performance in a, let's say, in a 10 meter sprint or in a jump after doing some, some, some heavy loading or some very intense stimulus. We go back to the very first question. You improve performance, but you don't know really well the neuromechanical uh, uh, mechanisms of that. Yeah. You know? So typically, to give you an example, I do a set of very heavy squats and then I jump higher then if I don't do these squats, fine. This is what, what maybe you can call PAP at some point. But this is not the question. The question is why? <laughs> the question <laughs> is why did I jump higher and, and why yeah. is it maybe an interesting solution? Same for heavy sleds. I have seen a study last week or the week before where they show that doing heavy sleds uh, improves the short sprint performance just after. Um, and Measuring the profile, I think it's a good idea because measuring the profile will maybe help better distinguish what is happening. So it's exactly the same as the, the beginning. We go from performance, that is a low level of information, to the mechanisms. So for example, I am, I am using a totally uh, a fictive scenario here. Let's say that when you improve jump eight, it's because the PAP gave you additional force orientation or um, a profile that is closer to your optimal profile. That, that could be a good, uh, a good information, you know? So, um, or maybe it's exactly the opposite. It gives you a power or a force orientation, but definitely uh, this should be done. The big issue will be that if you want to measure the force velocity profile in jumping, you will have to do several trials Seven. with different loading. Yeah. And this may interfere with the PAP because you see what I mean? It takes, it takes a few minutes. It That's takes a few concern. reps. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So <laughs> maybe you should, you should try to think about some solutions to, to, to better figure out. I give you my opinion. One solution is to use uh, what two studies have shown. It's the two load method. So two it means, method. yes, you, you, so you do a big PAP protocol, whatever you want, and then you can, assess the force velocity profile by doing just a single jump and a single loaded jump. So this has been shown in two different groups uh, studies and it's, it, the results are clear and it may help you to control that, that effect. So, but in my opinion, if you do uh, several times the same protocol without PAP in the same people, and if you compare that to several times the PAP protocol, uh, statistically, maybe you will have some, some more uh, solid and stable uh, conclusions. So yeah. I, I think it will be clearer if you repeat uh, the protocols uh, to be sure of the effect. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. definitely it is tricky because the protocol itself stimulates. This is a reason why, for example, in the protocol, I never put the squat jump at the end of the protocol. Because if you do several loaded jumps and then a squat jump, uh, there might be a risk of uh, influence of these yeah. loads on the final squat jump. So the, the final, yes, yeah. it's, it's difficult. Mm. It's difficult. Yeah. And, and I'm really interested uh, in that because uh, in uh, uh, its recent study of Garcia Hamus, we could see that uh, about the fatigue uh, that uh, it's uh, specific to the load we use and if we use a lot of repetitions or not. And uh, I, I'm uh, really curious to, to know if there's uh, the same thing with a protocol of PAP. 
Yeah. And uh, so you will be very interesting in the studies of uh, Jean Rivière about fatigue because that's exactly the, the point of his studies. Uh, for example, if, if you and I, we repeat some jumps until very, fati uh, very much fatigue, okay? But I repeat that with heavy loads and you repeat that with lighter loads, yeah. the change in performance will be different. So it means that, um, again, that's a support for the force velocity endurance fatigue, so a profile. So yes, I think it's, uh, it's about the same. It's, uh, it's what's fascinating in, in PAP protocols is why exactly did that overload uh, improve my, my acute performance? Yeah. I see. And now I, I want to ask you uh, what you are thinking uh, about studying in the future. I think now you, you are trying to um, go in the more uh, rehabilitation, I don't know if you can say like that, way uh, of, of testing the force velocity profile. But I don't know. I want to ask you that what you have yeah so the, for the the, yeah for the future the main plans are um using these methods i think the methods are pretty solid uh they, they will always be criticized but this is normal um they are pretty solid and now the the studies will be by people in the in the field in everyday okay. life how can they use that in rehab how can they use that in training uh so that's for one The second one is that we will try to find more, um, uh, let's say, real life approaches. Because honestly, even if it's practical, a linear sprint test or a vertical jump test, they remain laboratory tests. They, re they are closer to the real life sports activities, but they are not really, really uh, totally the real life activities. So, so, We have developed some methods to do that in sprinting, for example, in football. And uh, I think it's going to be with accelerometers and things like that. It's going to be fascinating to see how can we measure that during the real life activity. So that's the second thing. And the last thing is a bit more uh, um, fundamental science. With the new lab I am working at, we have, we have almost all the devices to study sprint mechanics and physiology. And I think we are going to go a bit deeper on the sprint mechanics and physiology. So again, we are going to go far away from performance to find some things and maybe come back to performance. Okay. But that's, that's the normal cycle of research. Some, sometimes you need to step back from, from training. And then if you find something, then you go back to the training field. This is a, a constant dialogue between, between research and coaches. Yeah, you talk, you talked about a uh, little bit about the field uh, tests. Uh, you know some errors uh, coaches uh, uh, often do when they are trying to assess uh, the force velocity profile. Yes, uh, so I'm going to give you one, and unfortunately, some researchers do the same. So this is a bit, this is a bit boring. Um, the the main mistake is that the again, as I said, the inputs of the methods are jump eight and sprint times. So if you don't measure jump aid correctly, and if you don't measure sprint time correctly, then the, the computation will give you some data that don't make sense, which is normal. It is not the problem with the equations. It's the problem with the, you know, what you enter in it. So the idea is um, if you measure jump aid and, and the, 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 the athletes that you measure are too much variable, it means if you do a squat jump, And they give you a squat jump that is five centimeters different from one, one trial to the other. This should be corrected. So that this is the big mistake. Because the problem is that if you do some jump eights that are very different because you don't know how to jump correctly, you will have some very variable profiles. Yeah. And you will have some unclear conclusions. And the big problem is that, and we are going to write a commentary on that, The big problem is that in the literature in the last year, there's been one or two papers like that. And they conclude that the force velocity profile is not correctly, is, it's not reliable enough. But when you look at the raw data, you see some crazy stuff. You see some people that jump from one day to the next day, 10 centimeters different. Of course, 
this is a problem with the measurement or this is a problem with the instruction or I don't know, but for sure, if they do that from one day to another, yes, their force velocity profile will be crazy different from one day to another. But it's not about the, 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 um, the problem with the, with the profile itself. It's a problem with the input. I can give you the very same profile today and tomorrow because I jump correctly and I jump with the loads the exact same, you see? So this is, this is the main mistake that, that coaches should avoid. And it's exactly the same in sprinting. If you measure sprint times with, I don't know, timing gates, and you don't start the timing gate at the same moment, or if you use my sprint app and you don't click the, the images correctly, yes, the profile will be variable again because of the inputs. So I would say it's, it's I, I summarize this by saying that simple doesn't equal to easy. It's yeah. a simple computation, but you have to be very, very careful with the input because as any computation, it will give you a wrong mistake. So it's exactly the same. I don't know if you know a bit about uh, heart rate variability. You know that some, some watches measure heart rate variability or yeah. some software. And if you don't measure the heart rate variability in the very same moment of the day after a night and blah, 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 you will have crazy variability in that. But it's not about the concept. It's about how you measure that. Yeah. I, I have seen some football clubs. They, they use the heart rate variability in the morning and some, some guys were late in training and they ran out of the bus just to be on time for testing. And they put the watch and they say, okay, stay calm and we measure the variability. Where is the problem? It's not yeah. in the watch. It's not in the concept. It's in the procedure, you see? So, procedure. so people have to be very careful with the procedure. Yeah. I see. And with jumping, uh, yeah, I, I, I think we can see in real time when someone doesn't know how to jump or it's the first time they are doing that, you can see the improvement in real time. <laughs> of course, of course. And this is why I never test in, in coaching or in consulting or in research. We never collect the data during the first session yeah. because we know that the first session will be discovering what's a jump, knowing how to avoid counter movement, how to place the foot correctly. If you land with the foot like this or with the foot like that, it's five centimeters difference, yeah. which is yeah. sometimes 20% of your performance. So, yeah. uh, and, and again, when the, when the athletes are um, uh, stable, there shouldn't be more than 5% difference. So again, when I see some raw data of jump aids in some papers, And I see people, you know, changing performance by more than five, six, eight, 10 centimeters. I go crazy because obviously it is because the jumping technique and, and was not verified or was not correctly, you know, uh, uh, checked. Yeah. But, But my experience is that even young people, if you teach them correctly, after the first session, they will jump the same. Everything will be okay. Yeah. I see. So you you would say like one uh, one session to to get used to the yeah. jump is uh, sufficient to to. Well, most of the athletes I work with, it was, but it <laughs> that's important. It's it's not any type of session. It's a one to one session. I mean, you are with the athletes, and every jump they do, you coach them. It is mm. not just like go okay. to the gym and do the jumps and I'm going to have a coffee with my friends. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a careful session. But yeah. when you do that, uh, maybe, maybe the session will be in total something like 50 jumps, you know, 60 jumps. But at least at the end of the session, they jump correctly, they are reproducible, and they know how to jump against some loads. When you have that, Yes, you can study the profile. I see. Most, of the time, most of the time, the change in the profile is in fact what we call a familiarization effect. I yeah. am better tomorrow because I just learned the technique, as you said. You yeah. should avoid that. True. And, um, and um, how often uh, should a coach uh, access the, the force velocity profile of the athletes? 
honestly, this this depends. It depends on the objectives. It depends uh, how you want to use the information. If you just want to know their their physical status at the beginning of the season, then just do a test once, just to know. You know, if you want to use that information, my opinion is that, and, and my practice is that, one month or two months is a good pace. Again, it only requires a couple of jumps and it only requires a sprint. So it means this is not very taxing. It's not a maximum effort until VO2 max. It's not, you know, so it's, it's pretty easy to do, but I would, I would not be longer than two months because in two months, eight weeks, physical capabilities change under, change you know, training or fatigue. Yeah. So if you really want to use that to inform your training, I, I, I wouldn't recommend more than two months before b- between two profiles. Same for injuries. For example, if you, let's say you have an issue at the hamstrings, it will change your, your profile, you know? Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you let more than two months, you may miss the information. So that, that's, that's realistic, I think. Yeah. And, and you think we could, uh, I, I'm thinking about it uh, now, if we could use uh, the force velocity profile the same way uh, coaches, a lot of coaches now use the counter movement jump to assess if the, the readiness of the athlete for the accession. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, honestly, it's, you know, look, we have validated all the equations and methods with the CMG as well. So let's say that you are using the CMG for the readiness, okay? So yeah. you, you ask very often your athletes to do a CMG because, you know, yeah. it's easy. <laughs> If you use the two-load profile uh, or the three-load profile, you will do exactly the same, except that in addition to a classic CMJ, you will do one or two loaded CMJs. So it's a discussion, for example, I had with an NBA club, uh, with the physical coaches, They wanted to regularly monitor the readiness and they used the CMJ on a platform and they wanted to have the profile because they understood that just one CMG doesn't tell everything. Yeah. So we said, okay, do exactly the same, except that instead of doing two CMJs, the players will do two CMJs and then two CMJs with a pretty heavy load on the shoulders, like a back squat. So they, they got the players used to do that and then they have the monitoring. So I totally agree with you. It's, it's, it, it could be, we call that a monitoring routine. It could be something pretty easy to do. I saw that in a football club in, in, in England. They had a test where it was a single test with, I don't remember the load, but it was something like 40 kilograms. The players got the 40 kilograms. They did a maximum squat jump output, and it was measured with a a gym aware device. So we had, they had instantaneously their velocity. And so they knew that on that day, if the velocity was higher or lower than usual, their readiness was better or lower. So it's, it's exactly the same philosophy. Yeah. And uh, we, when we are uh, assessing the force velocity profile, the first um, jump we, we do will be without a load, right? And we, yeah. We, sh- we should um, do this one with uh, our hands in, uh, in the hips or we should like have, a, I, don't, I don't know, a broomstick and, and yes, use the, the same form in yeah, all. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, this, is, this is also something that we change over the time. If you read the first publications we did on that, we recommended to have the hands on the hips or yeah. crossed here on the, on the oh, torso course, yeah. Yeah. to avoid the hand movements. But you're correct. In order to have the very exactly same movement pattern, now I use a broomstick or I use okay. a plastic a plastic bar. So we have exactly the same back squat, you know, mechanics and position. Mechanics. Honestly, I don't think it changes the entire story, but it's it's it makes sense. It's exactly the same movement without load. So it does. So yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, I don't have any more answers for you. Um, I really enjoyed uh, talking with you. It was an honor. And Thanks. <laughs> My and, pleasure. And that, that, that's it. I don't know if you want to say, uh, like, when pe- where people can uh, find you 
uh, I know you have a YouTube channel. Yes. You, you so Twitter. My, my YouTube channel, I have a website that is uh, free and full of resources. That's jbmorin.net. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time I, I publish everything we do via Twitter because it's, it's the most direct and, and easy way to share uh, some things. So thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and good luck with the athletes and with the studies as well. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Okay. I finished the live.